were particularly interested in understanding how the electronic structure of oxides used in positive electrodes, uh, in particular, uh, the metal oxygen bond covalency, right? essentially how the Fermi level uh, relative to the oxygen p-band uh, of the oxide uh, interfacing with the apodic electrolytes and how the electronic structure would influence the reactivity uh, at the interface resulting to uh, degradation uh, or oxidation product. Uh, in particular, we have been utilizing a library of NMC materials to test and examine the reactivity between oxides and carbonate-based electrolytes. And interestingly, well, through the work of Huber Gastegger in Munich, they have shown for NMC811, it has a much earlier voltage onset for oxygen evolution right, relative to other lower nickel NMC materials. And as we have shown recently, along with other people's work uh, through uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy, uh, nickel NMC essentially um, oxidizes or uh, release oxygen at comparable oxidation state of nickel or comparable uh, ox uh, lithium deintegration amounts relative to other nickel-based materials, right? So then this is raises a really interesting question, right? So essentially they reach comparable amount of uh, lithium content around 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, um, and then release oxygen. But before that, the materials of different NMC with uh, various amount of nickel can exhibit a different degree of cycling degradation. In particular, as is shown through the work of Hubert, right, to uh, materials of NMC of uh, 111, 622, and 811, right? cycling to a comparable capacity or lithium amount, you see a significant greater degradation uh, of NMC811. So the question is why? Why 811 would exhibit greater degradation? And our current thinking is that is the surfaces can potentially exhibit uh, oxidative dehydrogenation more so than other NMC materials. So we began this research. This is the research done by Livia, looking at uh, uh, the surfaces reacting with carbonate solvent through various reaction mechanisms proposed in the literature in the past few decades. So we examined electrophilic attack, nucleophilic attack, uh, two different mechanisms because their nucleophilic attack is a popular thinking, uh, and also dissociation of EC molecules on the carbon surfaces and dissociation with oxygen extraction. And uh, through our DFT calculations, we find for layered compound, especially for late transition metal, the dissociation or oxidative dissociation of the EC or carbonate molecules is the most favorable. Right. So know that you have an EC molecule, it comes to the surface, and the surface essentially is able to strip a hydrogen from the EC molecule and then uh, essentially attach to a surface oxygen. And this hydrogen becomes proton with surface oxygen, and simultaneously the transition metal uh, of the surface is reduced. So we want to show uh, some of the comparison uh, from the calculation, uh, in particular looking at electrophilic attack and the, this dissociation reaction. If you look at the energetics uh, for these two mechanisms as function of transition metal, and you can see that for the dissociation, the driving force uh, essentially increases as we go to the late transition metal. On the other hand, for electrophilic attack, essentially it's independent of transition metal. In addition, that this dissociation mechanisms, essentially when it dissociate on surface, there is an exchange or charge transfer, roughly one electron between the EC molecule and oxide surfaces. Right? Essentially the surface has been reduced. On the other hand, for the electrophilic attack, uh, is, there's very minimum a charge transfer occurring. And this 
also uh, trend hold if we take lithium out of, let's say, lithium cobalt oxide, as we uh, essentially increase the covalency between cobalt and oxygen by deintercalating, we see the driving force increases for the dissociation reaction. Right? So to put this simply, we propose a mechanism where on a late transition metal oxides with high covalency, right? so uh, also in a highly charged state, the intercalated state, where the EC or other linear carbonate can come to the surface and become dissociated and generate protic species. And this protic species uh, absorbed on the surface oxygen can further react with the salt and generate HF and HF can further react with oxides potentially leading to the generation of cracks uh, and the swallowing of the electrodes. So this is uh, the, the thinking a mechanism uh, from the initial DFT studies. So we want to see whether, whether we can actually uh, develop a unified thinking or descriptor that will control the driving force of this process. And we know that if we change the Fermi level relative to the oxygen P band of these oxides, right, which is shown as the horizontal axis and the driving force increases. Right? So essentially going to the right, we're increasing the covalency of the metal uh, oxygen. So that's essentially late transition metal, nickel rich NMC materials at a high state of the charge. And the driving force essentially for the oxide surfaces to strip a hydrogen from the molecule off of carbonates and to, be, to generate a proton, the driving force, it can be as high as a 2 EV or 200 kilojoule per mole. And this trend can be even generalized or simplified by just essentially computing the absorption strength of hydrogen on the metal oxide surfaces. And this is uh, the work uh, in uh, collaboration with Jans Ross Meisel at University of Coburg. Copenhagen, where we're looking at absorption of hydrogen on various oxides and plotted as a surface P-band center. And very similar to what we have seen on the left, which is we're looking at the dissociative absorption of EC, there is a similar trend essentially going to a more covalent compound oxide surfaces, the driving force to essentially oxidize hydrogen or hydro carbon molecules or these small organic molecules increases. So we want to see whether this framework, this driving force, uh, as we increase metal oxygen covalency um, for dehydrogenation or oxidative dehydrogenation of carbonate, uh, whether it can be supported by experiments. So we conducted in situ FTIR. This is being done by E-Ray. So this is a schematic of this in-situ surface-enhanced FTIR, where we believe through uh, this measurement and also through our measurement related to electrocatalysis, we are probing the surfaces or we're probing the electrode electrolyte interface. Right. So we can look at uh, the CO double bond region of the EC, right? In the bulk electrolytes, you typically see two peaks. One is coordinated with lithium, the other one is free EC. You can also add, let's say, VC in the bulk electrolyte. VC exhibit a, a unique signal. Now, if we charge the NMC materials in this EC only electrolyte, uh, so we increase the voltage uh, we, from the differential spectra, we can see uh, the appearance of uh, a peak that had higher wave number relative to uh, the free EC and lithium coordinate EC. And this peak corresponding to that of VC. And this assignment is also further su supported by the DFT calculations of uh, various molecules of EC or dehydrogenated, one, essentially a de a dehydrogenated one hydrogen from EC or dehydrogenate essentially two hydrogen to form a VC and the wave numbers of computed 
and what we see matches very well. In addition, we could also form various oligomers due to these dehydrogenated species. And we can observe the presence of the oligomers if we do the following experiments. So we first charge to 4.4 volts, right? we generate VC, and then we essentially hold under open circuit conditions. And uh, you can see that with time, increasing time, the VC signal is in decreasing, right? So this suggesting uh, VC is soluble, right? So it's move away from the electrodes. And with increasing time, we see this peak at around 1813 uh, increases. And that corresponds to essentially what we computed for various oligomers uh, formed due to the oxidative dehydrogenation of the EC molecules. Right? So using this technique, not only you can actually see how the different species may form, and also you can observe potentially what species actually can diffuse away and what species may stuck on the surface. And we can contrast NMC811 with uh, and then see 111, right? So 111 surface is very stable, looking at differential spectra and charge all the way from open circuit voltage to 4.8, we don't really see any dehydrogenated uh, species. And this is very much in agreement with the computed trend with descriptor of for dehydrogenation, oxidative dehydrogenation on the surfaces. Right. So essentially, as we go from a nickel compound to a manganese rich compound, we decrease the driving force uh, for hydrogen absorption. Right. So this is very much in agreement. We also know that this technique is very sensitive to the state of the surfaces for ANMC811, right? So typically, if we have NMC811 laying around in the lab, it will collect, uh, exposed to ambient conditions, and on the surfaces, it may form various carbonate hydroxide species, right? So if you heat treat NMC811, you see that it actually generates uh, different species relative to what we have in uh, NMC811. Right. So essentially, you can see in heat treated, the pronounced signal that's generated is the BC. And uh, for the heat treated compound, we have presumably removed a large amount of lithium carbonates. And then if you look at only charging lithium carbonate in the FTIR cell, and you see the presence of formation of oligomers uh, with increasing uh, voltages. Right. So this is further confirms that tailoring the surfaces of oxide is critical to influence uh, or control the reactivity between uh, the electrolytes and positive electrode materials. To summarize what we have discussed so far, we're essentially um, proposing a mechanism, we call it dehydrogenation or oxidated dehydrogenation. It is the surface promoting the dehydrogenation or removing the hydrogen uh, from the carbonate molecules and generate protic species on the surface of oxide. And then these protic species can further attack or react with salt, generate HF, and further essentially uh, etch away or uh, leading to uh, cracking of the positive electrodes. This mechanism we want to point out is different from what has been proposed, for example, this uh, um, attacking of, uh, for example, singlet of oxygen proposed by Huber Gestegger is also different from the electrochemical oxidation of the solvent. Because this oxidative uh, dehydrogenation we propose happening on oxide surfaces, as you can see, seen from the FTIR, the generation of VC can uh, on the NMC A11 surface can start as low as 3.8 or 3.9 volt. So the question is, now knowing the mechanism, how can we uh, influence the reactivity? What will be the ways we can actually reduce the oxidative dehydrogenation reaction? 
So we can first control the surfaces, or we can also influence the solvent, modify the solvent, modify the electrolyte to reduce the activity. So I want to show you two quick results. One is uh, fairly straightforward. Many groups have shown that if you coat the surface of a NMC811, either with lumina or with, uh, for example, uh, fluoride um, containing compound. And as you can see from this descriptor, as you go from um, highly covalent oxide to a fluoride based a compound of cobalt or nickel, the driving force for hydrogen absorption is very low, right? So essentially, this much reduced oxidative dehydrogenation reaction. And this is in agreement with enhanced cycling of fluorine coated NMC811. In addition, if you modify the electrolyte, right, increasing essentially the concentration of the electrolyte, um, a salt concentration of the electrolyte, it can also increase the, uh, the cycling stability. Right? So this is work of Ryoshi Tatara. So he made the various uh, concentration of the electrolytes um, of lithium PF6 Essentially, when you reach roughly three molar of a concentration, there is no free EC or no free uh, EMC. And by getting rid of essentially the free EC, free EMC, uh, is seen much uh, improved stability. And this improved stability uh, can be explained through a DFT calculation of Livia, where if in presence of free EC, the barrier to have dehydrogenation is minimum, either from direct proton transfer or through a, a chemisorbed intermediates. On the other hand, if we have all the ECs are actually coordinated with lithium in a, these lithium EC complex, the barrier uh, for dehydrogenation uh, can be as high as a 2 EV, significantly reduce the kinetics of dehydrogenation reactions. And for both approach, right, further using in situ FTIR, you can see either uh, you modify the surface of oxides to reduce the surface reactivity towards electrolytes, or if you essentially lower the activity of free carbonate solvent in the electrolyte. Essentially, in both approaches, there is no generation, we detected no generation of the dehydrogenation of species upon charging to 4.8 volt in a similar uh, cell setup as we have seen previously. So I want to essentially uh, relate the oxidative dehydrogenation uh, of uh, apodic electrolytes. In our case, that increasing metal oxide covalency uh, is uh, detrimental to the battery performance. Uh, but it can also be used uh, to design um, interesting materials or de design interesting processes. For example, there's a large field of uh, doing selective oxidation of hydrocarbon or organic molecules. Uh, for example, if you want to oxidize methane to methanol, for example, how, how would you go uh, about doing it uh, selectively on the surfaces? And typically, in this field of selective oxidation, there are three general mechanisms of deprotonation, dehydrogenation, and there's a mechanism of oxidative dehydrogenation for selective oxidation. Right? And this is schematic is shown essentially for oxidative dehydrogenation of, uh, um, of methane, right? And you can see this is essentially through the same um, mechanism as we have uh, discussed for oxidative dehydrogenation or oxidation of our uh, carbonate molecules, right? So, so I want to essentially relate the surface reactivity of oxygen um, that degrade electrolytes can be also used for uh, controlling um, oxidation or selective oxidation various molecules for either making fuels or for chemical transformation. So this thinking can be generalized by looking at uh, the surface energetics of different sorbates uh, plotted as function of uh, uh, Fermi level relative to the oxygen p-band center. 
right? So the horizontal axis you can think of is a measure of surface uh, oxygen activity. This is computed, but we have also uh, measured it and validated through X-ray emission spectroscopy for a series of perovskites. So what is really interesting uh, in this graph, essentially you can see by controlling ox surface oxygen activity, you can control surface vacancy formation, you can control CO absorption, C CO2 absorption, and H absorption, and even methanol absorption. Essentially these um, absorption uh, energetics are correlated and they're controlled by oxygen uh, surface activity. On the other hand, if you absorb these species on the B side, they're weaker, right? So essentially further uh, support the surface uh, oxygen activity play a very important role. Of course, the surface oxygen activity is controlled by the covalency of metal oxygen bond. And this is another example of uh, the surface oxygen activity can control the NO redox, right? So how the NO can be reduced or oxidized to NO2 or NO3 is also controlled by oxygen P-band. And again, uh, this can be, you know, uh, applied to control catalysts for water splitting. So essentially, this essentially generalized one of our approach that is really controlling the oxygen uh, activity by uh, tailoring the oxide surface, uh, surface or bulk electronic structure. We can essentially correlate and tailor uh, activities for a number of reactions. So we can develop a unified uh, framework for uh, surface reactivity or catalytic uh, activity design. So I want to move uh, very quickly uh, to uh, our recent learning uh, in trying to develop a comprehensive um, framework to design of uh, apodic electrolyte. Uh, with no background in chemistry, organic chemistry. So a lot of this work is really through working and learning from my colleague, Jeremiah Johnson uh, at MIT in chemistry department. Right. So, so we started this work about five, six years ago uh, where we realized that there's no known electrolyte that's stable against a lithium uh, in the lithium oxygen battery. So we have to design new electrolyte and trying to develop a framework. How do you design electrolyte uh, small molecules that can be stable against a uh, superoxide or peroxide? So Jeremiah came up with this uh, is thinking that if you want to design stable apodic electrolyte, you have to design stability against you know, dehydrogenation reaction, right? So hydrogen removal, you have to design against proton removal, de deprotonation reaction, you have to design special, you know, remove special sites that can have nucleophilic attack. And of course you can also screen for um, electrochemical oxidation and uh, uh, reduction reactions. And so with this framework, uh, we have to study a large number of compounds or, or small molecules, uh, carbonate ethers, sulfur containing, nitrogen containing, right? So we can first do is uh, through the computation of shooting and later on valid through experiments uh, of Minjun, uh, where we essentially looking at these compounds uh, well, these molecules in, in different groups where we can look at uh, the protonation energy, right? So to look at which uh, site, um, which atom in a given molecule is prone to deprotonation, which atom uh, in a molecule is prone to dehydrogenation or nucleophilic attack, right? And then that gave us essentially design principles to essentially remove the sites we remove them in the molecular design size that are prone to, for example, hydrogen abstraction or proton abstraction or nucleophilic uh, attack. So through this uh, design uh, framework of computation, we, we apply this framework to design new molecules. And these are the two molecules that proposed and designed by Jeremiah and Minjun. Uh, essentially, these molecules, uh, one is uh, sulfamate and sulfon emit both actually are free of, if you will, what we would consider a vulnerable site uh, for um, hydrogen, proton, and nucleophilic attack. And uh, with uh, the um, presence of CH, uh, CF3 uh, functional groups, we can further 
essentially using its electron withdrawing power to increase its stability or electrochemical stability against oxidation. Right? So these compounds, they survived uh, test in peroxide, uh, superoxide at 80 degrees C for three days. Right? Essentially further support these essentially molecules uh, are stable against uh, these uh, reactions. And we also put them in a lithium oxygen cell, right? So, and then contrast uh, the stability of these, um, this sulfon emit electrolyte with lithium TFSI with uh, lithium TFSI in DMSO and also a G4 glime. And you can see that a cycling in lithium oxygen cells, let's say for a number of cycles, the DMSO would degrade to generate DMSO2, and the glime would degrade to generate four mates. On the other hand, this new electrolyte, uh, sulfon emit solvent with lithium PFSI salt, uh, it remain uh, stable. So this is helpful. It demonstrates this is, is possible to design using this framework. It's encouraging. Now, with the work of Olivia looking at surface reactivity of ECs and varying essentially the oxide surfaces where we're only looking at carbonate uh, molecules. And Olivia came up with this framework. Can we relate essentially the stability of, uh, framework of these small molecules against radicals in the solution and looking at the energetics of dehydrogenation, deprotonation, these small molecules in bulk, can we relate the energetic of these small molecules uh, against oxidation on the oxide surfaces? Right? So essentially bring essentially stability of these molecules uh, in bulk to essentially to the surfaces. Right? So first try is you look at what's the absorption energy of all these molecules on the surface and the surface uses the lithium nicolate and plotted as function of deprotonation energy, dehydrogenation energy, you can see there's absolutely no trend. On the other hand, see the absorption energy for these molecules actually scales with the CH bond oxidation, right? So there is a correlation, right? So the stronger absorption uh, to the surface uh, of these oxide surfaces, meaning the small molecule is being oxidized, is correlated with free energy of oxidizing the CH uh, bond. And using this thinking, you can actually further design new molecules, right? So for example, then this molecule and then projected onto this diagram, they have essentially reduced the driving force for surface absorption. And utilizing the same thinking, these, uh, we would expect these sulfon emit uh, salt would also have much reduced um, uh, absorption strength and due to uh, the, essentially their uh, lower free energy for oxidized the CH bond. So utilizing this sulfon emits electrolyte uh, in collaboration with uh, Julie's group, in particular Wei Zhang's work that uh, they have tested this electrolyte with NMC811 and the relative to the carbonate solvent is shown much greater stability and this sulfon emit salt or electrolyte has much reduced nickel dissolution and also this new electrolyte exhibit no evolution of CO2 electrolyte oxidation charging to high voltages. In addition, with this new electrolyte, uh, the particles of NMC crack less relative to what we have in the carbonate electrolyte. Right? So the thinking is uh, based on uh, the mechanism we have proposed, that carbonate easily can be oxidative, dehydrogenated, generates uh, protic species, HF, and essentially attack uh, and etch the particles uh, within along potentially the green boundaries. On the other hand, for this new electrolyte, it is much more oxidative, uh, stable uh, against the oxide, uh, where uh, relatively speaking, less protic uh, species, therefore uh, is in agreement with relatively intact particles. And then Julie's group, and also with um, the creativity of uh, 
the Wei Jiang, they were able to test uh, this electrolyte in a more um, practical conditions with a lower electrolyte carbon ratio and also a low negative or positive like ratio. Uh, you can see also this uh, sulfonyl inlet electrolyte uh, can last much longer than the carbonate electrolyte. Uh, in addition to its positive effect on the uh, positive electrode, we also know that uh, it appears the new electrolyte also gave rise to a flatter lithium surface with less porosity. So with the sulfonamid electrolyte, the lithium uh, thickness, metal thickness is around 10 times less than that uh, cycled or generated in the carbonate electrolyte. So this is something I don't understand and we'll be further exploring and try to uh, see how the electrolyte uh, compositions would influence the morphology and also the kinetics of lithium plating. So I want to end with, I think it's a really exciting topic of trying to understand the complex processes at the electrode electrolyte interface and to understand uh, you know, how the oxides will react electrolyte and how ICI make form. So I want to thank the co-workers and the collaborators uh, at MIT uh, and also outside MIT and our financial support. Thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much for the terrific talk and the deep dive. So now we're ready for some questions, but before we do that, um, I thought I would just make a personal observation um, you know, I have followed your work since when I was a graduate student. Uh, I still remember meeting you when we invited you to give a symposium maybe 15 years ago at Caltech. And I remember back then you were working on very different things. Um, you know, in your own um, thesis work, you were studying microscopy for battery materials. Then you moved to work on high temperature, fuel cells and electrolyzers. Then you moved to aqueous uh, electrochemistry, looking at uh, electrocatalysis, lithium air batteries, and now looking at um, interfacial reactions. So I, I'm, I'm just amazed at the breadth of the work, yet they are extremely unified, um, as you pointed out today, especially in your uh, mechanistic understanding, computational methods, experimental methods. So I thought maybe you can share for a moment with our audience um, sort of your, your guiding principle when it comes around to navigating these very different and sometimes very disconnected fields and communities. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't know what to say because this is not uh, by, it's not a plan, right? So I believe when we talk about work in the past or things happened in the past, we talk with certainty. Now, if we look forward, there is no certainty in what we do. And uh, so therefore I could not uh, comment to say we do this by design, but rather than I think maybe it's the fortune of running into uh, colleagues that, uh, that can really inspire us, get our excited and or easy to work with or willing to, to teach us um, new uh, fields. And so we essentially, in some ways, and pull into these areas and just by curiosity. And then, of course, what I think will, there's a lot of work maybe did not fit. Uh, I did not talk about, right? So it doesn't mean that everything fit is really by design because it's the certainty of the past. Well, that's a wonderful lesson, I think. Um... If I think uh, if I were to extract uh, some wisdom from, from what you just said, uh, it's definitely be willing to listen to new people, talk to new people and explore new topics. Uh, and perhaps don't have too well defined of a strategy as to have a tunnel vision. So I think this is a really important uh, message, uh, especially to many of our younger audience and uh, aspiring and developing scientists. So thank you, Yang, very much for that insight into your journey. So maybe coming into the, the specifics of your talk, so there, there are a number of questions and I thought I would start um, at the higher level. So you discuss a lot about stability um, of solvent in the positive electrocyte. 
But obviously, when you start to play with the solvent, they will have effect on the electrolyte transport in terms of diffusion, uh, stability at the negative electrode. Um, I know that you didn't have time to talk about it today, but what are some of the general consideration when we start tuning one of the knob to modify the property, how it would have trade-offs for the other component of the battery? Yeah, but fantastic. Um, so, so in fact, uh, this is something that, uh, you know, we uh, are being working on this uh, in terms of looking at the scriptures for ion mobility, right? And, uh, and we just begin to understand or have some understanding uh, in this regard. And this is really, I, I think it's very interesting because one can potentially unify the two field of kinetics or, or charge transfer kinetics, for example, Marcus theory um, to uh, also utilize this thinking, looking at transport or ion mobility uh, in the liquid or polymer or, or in ceramics, right? So I think the connection is there, right? So, so it is really how do you design uh, a certain uh, stability or reactivity, but at the same time, and how would you design essentially the barriers uh, or the free energy uh, landscape to facilitate ion mobility? They're not the same, but can in some cases uh, correlate it. On the other hand, I think this, the second part of your question is, how do we design stability against lithium? And this is something is very new. We just started maybe a year, two years ago. I, I'm, I would say I'm really ignorant. There's a lot of people whom I'm working with and learning uh, from uh, collaborating with Shirley Meng, uh, working with Bay Tar Gallant, uh, and also uh, there is a large group uh, that has been led by Cleo Amin and also Martin Winter, uh, this uh, US German collaboration on this lithium electrolyte interface. So there's a lot of expertise, um, but we don't have much to say in that regard, but rather than I think it's just fascinating. I think it would be really cool to understand why and how the electrolyte can change so much the morphology and the kinetics of lithium stripping and uh, plating. Well, on a personal I, note, I just think that- Talking a little bit, yeah. Go ahead, Yi. Yeah, so a uh, young great talk and uh, speaking of that, right? So particularly based on your uh, results of uh, dehydrogenation, uh, <clears throat> this is proton generated. I'm also thinking now the cathode side of generation of proton, they will diffuse and go to the anode. Um, and uh, have you look at this, uh, you know, communication, the coupling <laughs> effect <laughs> uh, from cathode going to the end now? <clears throat> we have not uh, looked at this. Um, so, but I think this is a really interesting question. If I recall correctly, I believe Hubert has been looking at some of the effects, but this is something I think will be really interesting to look into. Yeah. Into yeah, and also related to that, uh, you have this beautiful, you know, uh, you keep monitoring this uh, reaction, the EC, how you get, how do you activate uh, this molecule? I, I really like your viewpoint from a really catalytic uh, <clears throat> uh, po point of view to study this process. Um, so then this species, once you put this away, you know, certainly CEI is the, uh, uh, the, the layer people try to start, it's very controversial, whether the CEI right there or just not CEI, what's really there. Once you look at it, it sounds like it's there, it's not there. So I mean, this it's very complex. Yeah, I also want to pick your thought a little bit about CEI. Right, so, uh, so this is something that uh, is really interesting because the CEI is also perhaps like SEI, is dynamic. Right? For example, like these highly concentrated electrolyte salt we uh, did, right? we thought, okay, if we cycle once and then generate a stable surface, we should be able to cycle in a dilute electrolyte, but in fact, it doesn't work. Right? So, so, so then it means somehow the surfaces uh, resume back and of course, simultaneously, we've seen that uh, you know if you uh, cycle in these carbonate electrolyte NCA11, you see um, metal oxyfluoride and nickel oxy metal fluoride forms, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, but this 
it appears to not passivating, it's still developing, right? Maybe this is in part related to generating new surfaces, right? Uh, as we continue to cycle. In contrast to if you coat, it appears to be more effective uh, in terms of uh, um, slow down the dehydrogenation or generation of protic species. Oh, well, back to you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. That was uh, actually the question I was going to ask um, about CEI. But maybe let me just make one observation. I think um, the co-optimization of all of these different things, EU mentioned um, the diffusion of species to the negative electrode, I think actually makes a very fascinating scientific problem. It's a, a very difficult problem. So maybe coming to the CEI, um, one of the thing that I thought it's very difficult to understand when it comes to electro-electrolyte interfaces is heterogeneity. So Yang, you appreciate from the electrocatalysis community, say in, in, in aqueous systems, that there are a range of active sites and so forth. And when we look at cathodes, I think one of the most strange thing is that folks have done all kinds of coding and some of them work really well, but almost all of those coding are not conformal completely. They're always exposed sites. Sometimes it's coded in a very uh, non-conformal manner. It's particulate, but they work, they work really well. Um, so can you give us some insight to how to think about the coding or whatever decomposition you have, which does not occur conformally yet, it tends to say protect the entire cathode particle. I think this is really one of those uh, really strange uh, mysteries, uh, at least to me. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. So I don't know the answer, but I can you know, speculate and um, I, I don't know. Uh, for example, I think the process is really dynamic, right? So as we've seen that you know, transition metal can dissolve right, in the presence of HF, and transition metal can form metal fluoride or metal oxy fluoride. And we know if we coat with fluorides, it stabilizes. So I think it's really a dynamic process, right? So let's say you coat alumina, right? It's like you said, most of cases really not monolayer full coverage. But the other hand, it generates codex species, right? And so then I think there is essentially this two processes, potential competing processes going on. One is dissolving the metal, but at the same time, it's also forming a protective layer. And I think it's really a matter of how well it can cycle. It really depends on the, um, which process it potentially is faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and right. yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, please. I, I was just going to say that a, a related question is also, you talk a lot about how the metal oxide can affect the electrolyte. But of course, the opposite is also true. I think you hinted this, for example, in the microstructure uh, degradation. So, so one question is on, can the solvent also affect things like densification at the interface. And you just mentioned, for example, dissolution, which leads to the formation of metal vacancies. So this kind of a forward backward interaction between the electromaterial and electrolyte uh, also seems quite interesting. Can you comment on sort of the, the processes and mechanism in which the electrolyte affects the electrode? Yeah, so, so I, I, I don't know if I fully understood your question, but if I uh, try to answer essentially if, look at this image here, right? So if you have this NMC cycle in the carbonate and with time after hundreds of cycles, you see cracks, right? And uh, presumably this gave rise to the, the swelling that Jeff presented earlier, right? So, so essentially when you have a carbonate electrolyte generate uh, protic species, it appears to be able to, you know, go through attack of the green, along the green boundaries and generate new surfaces and fresh surfaces. On the other hand, if you threw electrolyte design, presumably with this new electrolyte, we have much less protic species because we have minimum solubility of the transition metal. And then you see the particles, the polycrystalline particles retain largely intact. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I think yeah, that's absolutely um, the right thinking here. And additionally, I was also thinking, can the solvent affect the thermodynamic energetics in the cathode? So if you change the solvent, can you, for example, change the migration energy or can you change the um, stability leading to reconstruction of the interfaces? Just borrowing a lot of the similar concept from electrocatalysis that the catalyst is also modified by the solvent environment as well. Um, that's a great question. So that's actually, it's really exciting to study in the uh, chemistry that revolve involving redox species that are soluble, right? So let's say if you look at the redox couple of oxygen to superoxide, where superoxide is soluble. If it's something soluble, then it can be energetics, free energy can be modified by solvent molecules, by ions around forming complexes. And that in the past work, we have seen as varying solvent, you can tune the thermodynamics, the energetics, but up to 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.3 eV. On the other hand, you can also tune the lithium redox potential up to 0 0.4 uh, eV, right? Meaning the lithium typically um, has a stronger interactions with uh, the solvent, right? So typically if you go to a, a higher donor number solvent, it would solvate lithium more. And so essentially you can build a lithium lithium battery of 0.4 volt, right? With the same electrode, but two sides of immiscible solvents, for, for example. That, that's generally, I think, is point to your, your question, but you know, typically that's a very small amount of energy that one can capture. Yeah, I, I, I agree they're small, but I think they, they can still be appreciable. So I think this would be an exciting area to think about. Maybe one more technical question um, before uh, uh, we have a, maybe a broader discussion. So in the beginning of your talk, you show some really beautiful computation um, of adsorption energetics, um, dissociation energetics of carbonates on metal oxides. Uh, later on, you also showed how these energetics are modified when you go from, say, NMC111 to nickel-rich compositions. So the question is, how do you think about the effect of the oxidation state of the transition metal? So when you change the nickel content, uh, for the fully lithiated state, the oxidation state is changing when you change nickel content. Is that the dominant driving force for affecting the energetics in terms of the oxidation state? And related to this question, when you remove lithium, right? So when you charge the battery, then you also have the oxidation state once again changing. How does that uh, change in the state of charge then affect the energetics. So this is a function of composition, basically, and oxidation state uh, as a function of nickel, as a function of lithium content. Great, great question. So this is what we uh, aim to um, uh, explain with this descriptor of oxygen p-band, uh, Fermi level relative to the oxygen p-band, because they take into all these factors, uh, as you mentioned, right, by changing the d electrons and also the oxidation state of this uh, d electron uh, of the d metal, right. So you can see that uh, as you vary the surface p-band, and you can see that uh, essentially as you take more lithium out the oxygen p-band, you can see is plotted relative to the Fermi level, so shifted to the right, right? And as you go to later transition model, it shifted to the right, right? So essentially there's a number of factors, right? You can actually, you, they're compounded and then they essentially shown uh, as essentially this type of linear correlation with absorption energy of, uh, of hydrogen on the surfaces as function of oxygen p-band center, right? So, so then if you, you say, okay, what does it mean, right? So why does it, you have this correlation when you go from early transition metal fully uh, lithiated to the late transition metal fully delithiated, why there is a driving force of 2 eV of difference, right? And you can think of this difference is that uh, the surfaces of nickel O2, right? So nickel O2, let's say, if this ever existed, nickel four plus, right? 
it, it really doesn't want to be nickel four plus. So then when you have absorption of hydrogen or absorption of EC molecules, it, essentially the transition metal wants to be reduced to essentially three plus or two plus. And that is what essentially is the process of oxidative dehydrogenation, right? So it is you either through hydrogen absorption to generate a protons, that electron, that hydrogen lost, is actually given to the transition metal. And that essentially is the, really the driving force. Does, yeah, does can I mean? interpret this linear relationship here as that the electronic effect is dominating here? Because you can explain everything basically in terms of the um, the bend center and oxidation state, essentially. Yes. This is very exciting finding. Thank you. So, E, back to you. Yeah. So, Yang, um, thank you for sharing about the insight. Um, I think this we touched upon quite a bit already. But let me uh, ask again, maybe from this very big picture. Right? Every time you know, I think about electrolyte. This is a really multi-parameters space optimization. You need to consider melting point, the boiling point, the viscosity, electrochemical stability, the ability to solvate lithium salts, the anode uh, you know, reduction stability, the cathode oxidation stability. You have been you know, working in the area for a long time. Uh, how do V, how do you go about to start to think about well, how do I design the electrolyte? You know, how, what do I need to look into first? You know, step one, two, three, and how, how do we do that? I, I think the audience right here will be interested in this question. You know, electrolyte sounds like an area. You, you kind of, you know, trying it by arrow, trying a lot, and then try to make a sense out of it. Uh, uh, much, much harder to, to make progress. But after so many years of learning, you know, certainly at lithium ion, we're still in the carbonate, that few molecules are solid, right? And, and that still in that regime, adding some a lot, lot of additives. So how, how do we go about think to design the electrolyte? So can you share some of the thoughts with all this? I know it's not an easy question. That's why it's at the end of the panel <laughs> discussion. Thanks. Uh, Eve, for, for this great question. Yeah, so we've been thinking about uh, how to design electrolytes uh, for some time, maybe five years, but we haven't had any publications in this regard, just because I think there's an overwhelming amount of uh, composition and processing and then performance. Uh, and we're trying to uh, develop some sort of a universal descriptors for ion mobility or ion conductivity for liquid polymers and electrolytes. And uh, I would say we have, we are still in the process um, to, to try to take what we, the little bit we learned and apply and trying to design new electrolytes. So I want to say that uh, I believe many of the properties that we uh, talk about for example, viscosity, melting point, and ion mobility, they are actually, we believe that they're physically correlated. Right? So they're actually could be potentially governed by the similar energetics that gave rise to similar viscosity or similar viscosity trend. Right? So very often you see, see the conductivity trend typically correlated with viscosity. Right? And so what we try to uh, understand that this time uh, I should mention that uh, the work we've been actually doing is a support, uh, supported by Toyota Research Institute for some time. This is in collaboration with uh, Jeff Grossman, uh, MD person, Rafa uh, Bumper Rally, and he's a machine learning person, and Jeremiah and Adam Willard. So essentially we are taking a combined high throughput and also machine learning approach, not only generating our own data, but mining the data from past literatures and trying to see if there is a correlation or a map that we can see there's some directions that we can learn about physical intuition or 
tricks to design electrolytes. And uh, I would say we're still in the midst of doing it, but it's really, I think it's really fascinating, especially we're interested in looking at how to think about the ion mobility, this uh, essentially ion in liquid polymer when it move is also activated. And how do we think about design the barriers uh, through really the salvation structure and the dynamics and how do that even correlate with, for example, what we typically think about uh, in catalysis or electrocatalysis in terms of designing the activated, uh, designing the barriers. So that's really the direction we, we're, we're interested in. Hopefully we'll have something uh, interesting to say in a few years. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Back to you, Will. Thank you, Yi. Yeah, I think our time is, is coming to end here, and I think Yang Nosa has a hard stop. Um, so I just want to, again, um, I'm so impressed by the talks today because we went from devices to microstructure to molecular chemistry in just a little under two hours. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. I think it also points to the complexity of lithium ion batteries in general. I'm actually surprised the battery works at all. This is so complicated. So <laughs> uh, I think this is all a mystery. Uh, I'm sure Stan Wintingham, who is usually in our audience can appreciate this. Uh, Justin, if I can have the, um, the slide, we have a very exciting event uh, coming up uh, in two weeks, uh, two, um, two weeks from today, uh, a Friday, 7 a.m. Pacific. And the topic is going to be storage X, where X is equal to long duration storage. We already had one such symposium featuring Mike Aziz at Harvard and also George Crabtree at Oregon. And now we're gonna have a second one. And the second um, long duration storage discussion will involve colleagues from industry and specifically three very promising startups working on different aspects of long duration energy storage. We will have um, the co-founder of Energy Vault, um, Andrea Padaretti, who is looking at mechanical energy uh, as a way to store um, electrical energy in the grid. Uh, we will have um, Jorik uh, Hanneman, who is the CEO of Enervenue, uh, looking at um, chemistry for long duration storage. And then we will also have a very different talk uh, from the co-founder of Form Energy on the importance of understanding the grid. Because only by understanding the electrical grid, then you can understand the value and the cost of energy storage. And that will be given by Marco Ferreira. So I hope you will mark your calendars for two weeks from today for this, what I think to be a very different and very exciting um, discussion around long duration storage. And again, I'd like to wish everyone a great new year in 2021. And uh, thank you very much for joining today.